Brooklyn, Chapter 6, we look at the electronic structure of atoms. Within this video, I'm going to give an overview of the ideas that are at the start of the chapter, beginning with properties of light. When we're thinking about the electromagnetic spectrum, we want to know its characteristics as a wave, consider things like its wavelength, be able to do calculations involving the speed of light, and conversions involving wavelength and frequency. Oftentimes we need to convert between meters and nanometers as well. And when it comes to the electromagnetic spectrum, know the different regions and be able to put them in order in terms of frequency, wavelength, and energy. The second topic within the chapter involves quantized energy, the contributions of Planck and black body radiation, and Einstein and the photoelectric effect. I think you probably recall ideas from section 6.1 on properties of light. Those were a review for you whereas the ideas in 6.2 are new. So take a second, what do you remember about these ideas? What do you recall when it comes to Planck and Einstein? Share your ideas. In 6.2, that's where we saw for the first time the idea of quantized energy and the introduction of the idea of photons. Black body radiation was the phenomenon where when the temperature of an object increases, initially it might emit infrared, it might even emit heat, and then the profile shifts and eventually it will start to emit in the visible region, and then perhaps all the way over into the ultraviolet. This particular profile is what Planck explained. It was an experimental result and he explained it by stating that the energy was quantized. E equals h nu is giving a step size for an increment of the light. This idea of uh, something being quantized, how you can be on one particular step or another particular step, but never in between, how you needed to have specific values. That's being introduced here by Planck. And as we know what's in front of us with quantum mechanics, it's going to show up again and again. But this is the first time. The other idea in this section was Einstein's explanation for the photoelectric effect. The phenomena shining light onto a metal surface can eject electrons. He explained that by using the same expression E equals h nu and now considered the energy to be that of a particle of light, a photon. Within this experiment, the frequency of light is what's crucial. It must be above a particular threshold value. If it's below that, it doesn't matter the intensity of light, its brightness. But with our expression E equals h nu, the energy is related to the frequency. In this explanation, it's as if the light, which we previously mentioned had a wave description, is acting like a particle as well, a particle of light called a photon. Here's an example question, considering what does it mean to consider light to be a particle with energy equals h nu. The scenario is that what does it mean to have a chemical bond broken by irradiating it with light? The description right here for the strength of the bond, 242 kilojoules per mole. First task would be what would be the energy required to just break one of the bonds, not a mole's worth, just a single one. So I do a conversion here, converting 242 kilojoules per mole to how many joules it would be for one of the bonds. Then an application of E equals h nu to consider the frequency and a conversion from the frequency to the wavelength using the speed of light, considering either a length there in meters or a length in nanometers. When it comes to line spectra and Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom, we did quite a bit with Bohr's model. We considered the phenomena of line spectra, looked at the model itself, the various energy states, and considered limitations of the model. Beginning first with the line spectra, we had the idea that you could have white light, which gives you a continuous spectrum. We, Roy G. Bibb, all the colors of the rainbow. A line spectrum does not have every color. The way that you could experimentally get this, put gas into what's called a discharge tube, send electricity through. When you then separate that light into its component colors, 
you don't see all the colors of the rainbow. You see instead distinct lines. This was the line spectrum here for hydrogen. Other line spectrum for other elements. What was this pattern? Why was it different for different elements? For hydrogen, it follows a very simple pattern, very simple mathematical relationship being shown here. The different end values, in this case, were simply integers, but they could explain the positions for the emission spectrum for hydrogen. Now, I think you know where this is going. Take a second. How is Bohr going to use this information? How are we going to use this information? We're not going to do calculations with this, but conceptually, where is this leading us? Take a second, see if you can recall that information. In Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom, he's bringing together Rutherford's nuclear model, this line spectrum for hydrogen, and also the idea of quantized energy and the expression E equals H nu. He's going to have three different postulates. The first is that the orbits of the electron can only have certain radii. There will be allowed transitions between those, and that those allowed transitions are quantized and corresponding to the energy equals h nu. Here we see a representation for the different energy levels in Bohr's model. The one on the left here is showing a spatial representation, and on the one on the right, it's showing the different energy levels, beginning with n equals 1, the ground state. I think you know where we're going within this. After Bohr, we're going to move on to Schrodinger's model. So based just on the information within this slide, compare and contrast this initial description of Bohr's model with our more advanced current description from Schrodinger. How is the representation similar or different? How are the quantum numbers similar or different? Within Bohr's model, energy can be absorbed or emitted as the electron moves from one energy state to another. Within this representation, we have photons of light interacting with the electron and making it move from one energy level to another one. And we see within our representation here in terms of the energy, it can move from a lower energy state to a higher energy state if the photon that it absorbs matches that. These were the excited states. And then the electron moves back down. It could be in one step or multiple steps, but it always needs to be on one of these quantized energy levels. Each time it moves downward, it release, releases a photon. And that's what the line spectrum is recording. Take a second, consider this question. I think D is the best choice. I'm reading this carefully to first note that it's describing the emission and it's asking for the shortest wavelength. Take a second, where might a classmate make a mistake with this question. What do you think a common error would be? Looking at the wave behavior, we have ideas from de Broglie and Heisenberg. The wave behavior of matter is an idea linked to de Broglie. So the, we had the proposition that light behaves like a wave, but in the photoelectric effect, it seemed to be behaving like a particle, which we call a photon. Light seems to be both. What if matter can be both? What if matter can have a description as a wave? So within the de Broglie model, the electron is treated as a standing wave. It's shown here as being a standing wave that is fitting around this particular orbit. Now, when it comes to standing waves, we're going to see that idea as well when we think of atomic orbitals, when we think of hybrid orbitals, when we think of molecular orbitals. So I really like this introduction from de Broglie because in this case, it's a really simple wave. We're going to get more complex descriptions, but it's the same general idea. Now, what would be evidence for this? A particle like an electron could act like a wave. Here we see a description for how we could calculate the wavelength for matter. 
is equal to Planck's constant over the momentum, mass times velocity. Particles of matter have a wavelength, but it's usually too small to be measured. Evidence of something being a wave is it, it can be diffracted. Diffraction involves both constructive interference and destructive interference. That's what's giving rise to these patterns here. It occurs for x-rays. It also occurs for electrons. Electrons, neutrons, even small molecules exhibit diffractions. So they are waves. This idea of constructive interference, destructive interference. How is this going to be related and used when we get to the idea of molecular orbital theory? Within that section, we also looked at contributions from Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle. In classical physics, a particle's position and direction could be known precisely and simultaneously. However, in the quantum world, when we begin to think of things as having a wave description as well, that's not possible. Heisenberg's idea is that the uncertainty in measuring both the position and the momentum must be over a particular threshold value. We didn't do calculations with this, but we saw how that would indicate that Bohr's model violates the uncertainty principle. It's showing both the position of the electron and its energy with a uh, precise values simultaneously. Within the Schrodinger model, that's not the case. We still see quantized energy levels, but this description for where the particle is found is quite different. The energy will be quantized and precisely known. So therefore, we're going to describe the position in terms of probability. That model right there is what the quantum mechanical model is going to include.